should say at the outset, Kurt Gödel's perhaps not as famous as many of the big thinkers uh, who, who I think Gödel belongs in this sort of company, such as uh, Darwin, Newton, Einstein, Aristotle and the like. Um, main reason, I think, is logicians and mathematicians don't get their due. I think, you know, they don't just... It's hard to understand what a mathematician does. You can explain to people what was the basic ideas of Darwin or the basic ideas of even Newton. Einstein's a little bit harder, perhaps, but since we have many very good popular science writers who tend to particularly focus on physics, a lot of people have a, 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 at least a good idea of what... Uh, basics of some of Einstein's work and Newton's work. But mathematicians, I think, get uh, the, the rough end of the stick sometimes. And Kurt Gödel certainly belongs in that sort of company. I think the idea of the incompleteness theorem, which is what I really want to focus on tonight, is one of the truly revolutionary ideas of modern thought. Uh, absolutely monumental result. One of the major results in logic. Many people have said... Kurt Gödel is right up there with Aristotle and that the incompleteness results were the first major results in logic since Aristotle. So this is really big stuff. Uh, it will involve a little bit of logic and mathematics, but I will tread very gently through the technical details. In fact, why I chose Gödel, apart from anything else, is that the, 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 the idea itself is very simple. The, the incompleteness theorem that we'll get to shortly is a very intuitive and simple idea, uh, intuitive after, after the fact, but groundbreaking. So he, here is uh, Kurt, a quick biography. Born in 1906 uh, in the city of Brunn, now in the Czech Republic, graduated in 1924, studied physics, mathematics and philosophy at the University of Vienna, graduated with a DPhil in mathematics in 1929 uh, with a spectacular uh, thesis, um, which I won't talk about tonight, and continued his work there at the University of Vienna until his departure for the US in 1940. Uh, then he took up a position with uh, a good friend. He visited the US a couple of times prior to that and had met Albert Einstein, was very good friends with Einstein, and he ended up at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study and regular, regular walks, had his daily routine of going for walks and chats with Einstein. And he remained there until his retirement in 1976 and died a couple of years later uh, from starvation and exhaustion. You might think of a, a sad end to such a great life, but you know, if you're a rock star, you aspire to sort of die in a plane crash like Leonard Skinner or Buddy Holly or Otis Redding or you know, second best drowning your own vomit like Jimi Hendrix. But that's kind of, if you're a rock star, that's what you're after. If you're a mathematician and a logician, you know, dying of starvation and exhaustion is <laughs> right up there with drowning in your own vomit. You might think that being a mathematician and a logician, the personality disorder was redundant, but that would be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit mean-spirited. So some of his achievements. Uh, 1929, his doctoral dissertation uh, on the completeness of first-order logic. I, I won't explain what this means, but that was a, a major result at the time, the age of 23. The results will mostly focus on the first and second incompleteness theorems at the age of 25. Uh, then did some groundbreaking work in set theory, which he had actually been carried on through most of his career, but uh, perhaps the most famous of these results uh, was a result in 1940. And uh, if we get time, I might just mention these novel solutions to Einstein's field equations, just because they're so quirky and give you sort of some insight into the diversity of... of uh, things that Kurt Gödel carried around in his head. Uh, he was a foremost logician and mathematician, but he, he actually made major contributions to general relativity as well, in, in the most quirky and sort of odd way. So I ho hope we'll have time to just say a little bit about the, those solutions to Einstein's field equation. So 
Like any big thinker, you've got to understand a little bit about the times that they were thinking, and uh, no exception here. And Kurt Gödel came along at a fascinating time for mathematics and logic. Uh, in the early 20th century, the foundations of mathematics were in crisis. It, it's it's uh, uh, hard to overstate how serious things were in mathematics at the time. Bertrand Russell had shown that set theory was inconsistent. Set theory being the foundation, or at least that was the hope for everyone, that set theory was the, the mathematical theory that would underpin all of the rest of mathematics. This truly rigorous axiomatic system it was, the, it was the great hope of mathematics. And Bertrand Russell showed that it was inconsistent. It's not just has a bit of a flaw or a bit of a blemish. It's, that's about as bad as it gets for a mathematician. Uh, on the other side of things, Cantor had proved that if we have one infinite set, such as the natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, there are infinitely many of them. If we have one infinite set, and surely we do, because at least we have the natural numbers, there are infinitely many infinite sets, all that can be ranked in order. So it's not just a whole bunch of infinite sets all have the same size, but there are infinitely many different infinities. Hard to wrap your head around what that means without going into the mathematics, but this had been shown to be a natural consequence of the standard set theory of the time, along with the assumption that there is an infinite set. Again, amazing results. But both worrying in their particular ways. On the one hand, that mathematics is inconsistent, just to get a sense of, you know, who cares? Mathematics is inconsistent. Well, given that it's inconsistent, and given the classical logic that we are supposed to be using here, you can prove that 2 plus 2 equals 5. You can prove that I'm Elvis Presley. You can prove anything you like. Uh, the Riemann hypothesis, one of the most outstanding results in mathematics, can be proven in five lines, given that you've got an inconsistent theory. So it's really bad. You can prove all sorts of things which are true, but all sorts of things that are not true either. In fact, you can prove every other contradiction as well. One contradiction, and it blows up. That's worrying, for obvious reasons. The infinite stuff, worrying for more subtle reasons, just was not clear that people really had a good grip on what infinity was, that there could be infinitely many different infinities. If one infinity is bigger than the first infinity, then... Surely the first one wasn't really infinite. It must, you know, this must be something bigger than it. It can't be infinite. So people were worried that they even had a good grip on what infinitely many objects of any kind meant. Uh, and people were trying to find a consistent set theory. And at the same time, many of them were wary of Cantor's work on infinity. So along comes Frege. And he tried to set things on a firm basis. He thought, well, no wonder we don't understand all this business about infinity. We don't even understand the number two. You know, what on earth is the number two? What's the number three? What are the natural numbers about? What are they? We know how to use them and we know how to say things like two plus two equals four, but what are they? And he worried about this and most other people thought he was just mad. You know? Of course we know what the number two is. What the hell are you talking about? But he... He really worried and he thought that this was the root of a great deal of the, of the problems in mathematics and people didn't have a firm understanding of what mathematics was about. So he set things on a very firm foundation, laid out the assumptions, axiomatised basic arithmetic and as often happens, once you make it very clear what's going on, problems jump out at you. And this is what happened to Frege. Uh, Alberti Russell, uh, who was very influenced by Frege's work and had been reading Frege, realised that there was an inconsistency in Frege's system. And he wrote this very nice letter to, to Frege uh, a, a matter of days before his monumental work went to press, saying, you know, dear Professor Frege, um, you know, I, I, if I may be so bold as suggest that um, there's an inconsistency in your theory. And Frege, for what he, you know, for, to great credit to Frege, he saw it immediately and realised that this was devastating. What he didn't realise, actually, was this problem is generalisable. It wasn't just a problem for Frege. It was a problem for mathematics at the time. So to get a grip on what, was, what this contradiction is, a very, very old philosophical puzzle called the liar paradox, which is just simply 
this sentence is false. Now, if, if I think about that sentence for a moment, two possibilities. Either it's true or it's false, right? So if it's true, then what it says is the case. And what it says is that it's false. So if it's true, it's false. That's bad, right? Must be false. But if it's false, well, that's what it says it is. It says that it's false. So if it's false, then it's true. So if it's true, it's false, and if it's false, it's true. Contradiction. Well, contradiction on the assumption that it takes a truth value at all, but it, why shouldn't it? It looks like a perfectly well-formed sentence of English. And philosophers... You know, you might think, you know, we don't have a lot to do and we worry about things like this disproportionately, you know. Philosophers have worried about this for a couple of thousand years. And, and to be quite honest, we're no closer to a solution than, <laughs> than we were 2,000 years. But, but we've had a lot of fun in the meantime. Russell saw that this problem was generalisable to mathematics as well. So I won't go into the details, but the idea is very simple. You just consider a set. So you can a set is just a collection of things. The set of natural numbers, the set of people in this room, the set of chairs in this room. These are all sets, collections of things. You can have sets of sets. So Russell said, OK, what about the set of sets that are not members of themselves? And if you've done a little bit of mathematics or logic, you'll see that this is just the liar sentence in set theory form. Okay, so once you form this set, then you just ask the question. Okay, is that set a member of itself or is it not? If it is, then it's not, and if it's not, then it is. You get exactly the same conundrum as you do with the liar paradox. So the Russell set can be proven to be both a member of itself and not a member of itself. That's bad. Mathematics is not supposed to license those sorts of things. This is when Russell announced his result to Frege. Uh, it was a problem for Frege, but it was also a problem for just general set theory. In a way, Frege had just made the problem uh, so transparent because he'd been so clear about his assumptions. Now, shifting to the infinities uh, and Cantor's work, just to get a flavour for this, is, it's not that important, but it, it is kind of, well... You know, I'll admit to it, I'm a nerd and I love this kind of stuff, so I'll just <laughs> share with you some of the, the delight in set theory. So here's what Cantor was mucking around with. An important operation on sets is the power set. So the power set, once you've got a set of things, say I've got the set of people in this room, I can then think of the power set of that, which is the set of all subsets. So it's the set that consists of uh, me, then there's a set that consists of Meredith, and there's the set that consists of the gentleman here in the front row, then there's a set that consists of Meredith and me, and, and all the combinations, okay? All the ways you can pack that up, that's the set of all subsets. That's called the power set of a set. And according to set theory, you can always form the power set. If you've got a set, you can have a power set of it. No problems. So, uh, so here's, here's an example take the set that consists of just two things, zero and one. So the set, that, that, that bra those curly brackets, the first little curly brackets here just mean that that's the set. Zero and one considered as an object together, one thing. The collection of zero and one together, that set has two things in it, zero and one. The power set of that, that has, well, the empty set is always a subset of a given set. It's got the set that contains just the zero, just the one, and zero and one. So the power set has got four things in it. One, two, three, four. Okay. <coughs> Cardinality. Cardinality of a set is in some sense the size of the set. How big the set is. How many elements in it, if you like. So if two sets have the same cardinality, if and only if the elements of one can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the other. Okay, so... What that means, this is actually a crucial insight of, of Cantor, was that you don't have to count the thing.